So today we have a very special guest from the class of 1971, Paul Bergman. Um, Paul is an author of the recently released book, The Architecture of Stanley D. Anderson with James Tickner and William Bergman, which includes an entire chapter on the architecture of Lake Forest High School. So please sit back and enjoy this detailed look into the, the significant architecture of Lake Forest High School. And just before we begin, I'll read um, Paul's bio. So Paul Bergman is a lifelong resident of Lake Bluff, Illinois. Before venturing into corporate law, he worked at Stanley B. Anderson, beginning about fifth grade, mainly putting away flat files and detailed drawings in an estimated 10,000 drawing collection. Later, he managed correspondence and projects for the firm. He is a 1971 graduate of Lake Forest High School. The class of 1971 celebrated its 50th high school reunion in August. He is a board member of the Lake Bluff History Museum. He is a past board member of the Lake Forest Preservation Foundation and the Ellawa Farm Foundation, which raises funds to restore and preserve barns, stables, and outbuildings at Ellawa Farm. Paul is currently enrolled in the Master of Architectural Preservation at Boston Architectural College. When not involved in studying or local activities, he enjoys fishing in Canada and Mexico and traveling with his partner, Janet Gibson. So please welcome Paul Bergman. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, Susie, thank you for the introduction. And uh, I want to thank everybody for coming today. And uh, I want to thank you all for coming on a day that's this beautiful. It's really hard to be inside uh, this time of day on this beautiful day. So um, back this up. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. Yes, okay. So here we are. Here we are at the start here. So um, I want to give you, um, uh, I want to thank you all for attending. And uh, we're going to spend a lot of time looking at Lake Forest High School today. So there's fewer houses in this program than there are in some of the other programs that I put on regarding Stanley Anderson. So, as Susie mentioned, um, I started out working uh, in the firm as a young kid. Uh, in addition to putting drawings away, one of my first jobs was emptying all of the ashtrays and sweeping the floor and stuff. But I found out after my father died that uh, I realized that there was a fabulous trove of houses in all of this uh, collection. And uh, I'm still cataloging houses. 20 years after my father's death, I'm still cataloging houses. And I've been able to discover and catalog three houses after the book was published. So here we have the three architects in the center of Stanley Anderson, how he looked about 1946. Stanley was born in Lake Forest and attended Lake Forest College, the University of Illinois for its architecture program, and later he attended the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. On the right is his pre-World War II partner, Jim Tickner, Jim was from Peoria, and he met Stanley at U of I, and he left the firm about 1940 or 1941. And on the left is my dad, Bill Bergman. He joined Stanley in 1946 after World War II, and he's a generation younger than Anderson. He received his degree from the University of Minnesota, and for context, Anderson is 22 years older than, than my dad. So as we get started, I want to give you a little orientation of where we're going. I've broken this uh, program into a number of parts so that you can follow all the transitions from the firm's work. I'm not going to show you all 15 chapters in the book because we don't have that much time. There is so much work. Uh, this is firm is a very prolific firm. They did lots and lots of materials. But we're going to take a quick look at the English Village and Deer Path Hill Estates. Then we're going to go into the country Georgian era. We're going to spend quite a bit of time at Lake Forest High School and then finish up the country Georgian. We're going to go out to the horse country. Uh, Jennifer is here representing the, the horse country. Uh, and then we're going to talk about, uh, about the Bill Bergman years. So we begin with the English village. And in 1919, Stanley came home from World War I went to work for Howard Van Doren Shaw. And he would have been quite familiar with Shaw's Market Square, which was built from 1912 to 1916. 
And in five years' time, from 1925 to 1930, Stanley greatly enlarged Shaw's concept of a city beautiful style village in Lake Forest with his own English village concept. This is an important as the city is going to be talking about the villa, English village a lot in the next few years. And so over on the left, you see the Anderson Building on Western Avenue around 1905-1906. And we all know this as the Walgreens Building. The family ran a dry goods store on the first floor. The second floor was open for meetings, town meetings and dances and things like that. And Stanley's father ran the dry goods store. But also in this slide, I want you to see the higgledy piggledy collection of storefronts. Anderson, like Howard Van Dorn showed before him, wanted Lake Forest to look like a large English village that would date from about 1830s or so. And he wanted it to have a combination of Tudor and Georgian buildings. And so this slide, this is from the Chicago Tribune in 1926. And it kind of defines what Stanley was up to. Like a bit of high street in some Yorkshire village is what Stanley is trying to do. And he wanted to rebuild downtown Lake Forest into an English village. And in five years, he built a whole series of buildings to do that. The first of the buildings is what's called the East of Theater Building, which is this little Georgian building. And Stanley's goal was to try, try and create what looks like a prosperous English village. Looks like the Cotswolds, Broadway or Tewksbury. And then in 1926, he built the Fry and Udell building. Fry was a local plumber, and Udell was a local printer. Udell printed the Lake Forester, amongst other things. We then get to the C.T. Gunn building, and this was a grocery store when it started. It later became an A&P store. And this building, it's now the Midwest Bank, it's remarkable. It's been heavily remodeled a couple of times. Uh, the door has been moved, it's been substantially added to, it's been changed. And even though this building has been extensively remodeled, it still retains its essential Stanley Anderson essence. The next building, in, again in 1926, is the Eastwood Building. And this small, small little storefront had many stores in it over time. It's on Bank Lane next to what used to be the Market House restaurant. I think it's going to be Lake Colonial in a couple of weeks. And you can see City Hall in the background in this photograph. But what Anderson is trying to do here is he's trying to turn Bank Lane into an English muse. He wants this to be a narrow little back street that one finds in uh, the older parts of London. He wants this to be more of a pedestrian lane than a driving lane. The next building he builds is the Deer Path Theater building in 1927. And this is the building that visually connects the Deer Path Inn, a block to the south, with Market Square, a block to the north, and really forms the basis of Bank Lane being the connector between Market Square and the Deer Path Inn. And this is sort of the heart of the English village. And um, I don't know how many of you remember spending Saturday mornings here as a kid, uh, or later in life, Saturday night date nights here. I know I spent, uh, spent some nights here. And uh, sadly, the uh, interior was gutted out, uh, and I think either in the late 1980s or maybe the early 1990s. Um, so then we get to the police fire building. And in 1929, Anderson moved the police and fire departments out of City Hall and down the street. On the left side of the building was the original city tool shed built in about 1900 by Charles Frost. And Anderson put the two-story addition on that's on the right for the fire trucks and dormitory. And the back of this building backs onto Bank Lane, and it's now a central part of the Central Business District. Again, uh, soon to be, it, it says Market House, but soon to be Lake Colonial. So the next building is uh, what's now the Northern Trust. It was originally the first National Bank building. And this is the first of the grand country Georgian buildings that Anderson designed. So across the street is the Deer Path Theater building that I just showed you. And just to the west is the C.T. Gunn building. So this is what forms the nexus of the English village. So we're going to move around a little bit. Uh, 
and we're going to move out of the English village and take a look at some of the houses they did in this period. Um, two houses here, one in Waukegan, one in Hammond, Indiana. And you can see Anderson is starting to develop sort of a, develop a regional practice. The Staley McKean house is interesting in that Charles Staley was president of the biggest bank in Waukegan uh, called the State Bank. And the house was under construction in October 1929 when the Depression hit. Staley was wiped out and walked away from the unfinished house. Dr. McKean was an oral surgeon and took the house over. And in the Depression, his clients paid in cash. and He had the money to finish the building. And Mrs. Paxton was a widow of a very successful lumber merchant and banker in Indiana. Two more houses. Uh, the John Griffith House in Lake Forest. It's on Sheridan Road. Uh, John Griffith's real estate firm is still in business as Griffith, Grant, and Lackey. And he built this house in 1928, sold it a few years later. And the lower house is the uh, manse for the uh, Presbyterian Church. It's now the parish house there. And we're going to take a quick look at the James Lovell House. Lovell was head of both the Federal Bank Reserve and also the Chicago Continental Bank. And so he was quite a very important person in the banking industry, banking business. And he built this French Moment House in 1928. The um, Jeffrey Carquill House is a Maryland colonial style house. Uh, it's one of the early country Georgian houses. It's built in Highland Park, and Carquillville was an executive with the Nash Motor Car Company. And so here's a, a stair hall, and uh, I want you to take a look at the French doors that are leading into the dining room. And then here we are in the dining room. So the door on the left leads to one of the many porches of this house. And the door on the right is a false door and does not open. You'll notice it has no knob, and the panes are mirror rather than glass. The false door is used to maintain the symmetry of the room. Oops, too far. And so the last slide in this section is uh, Deer Path Hill Estates. Uh, this is at King Muir. Uh, this is a subdivision that Stanley and Henry Turnbull launched in 1926. We know this area today is King Muir Road at Deer Path, but it was called Deer Path Hill Estates back in 1926 and 1927. And the Depression was not going to be very nice to Henry Turnbull. Um, he went precipitously bankrupt uh, with all of the houses that he had built much like the Depression we had in 2008. <clears throat> Anderson didn't build all of the houses on the development, uh, and I placed this entire neighborhood on the National Historic Register in 2006. And so we shift gears a little bit. We come to the end of the English Village era. The stock market, the stock market crashed in 1929, and the world changed forever at that point. English cottage styles that we've seen just died out in popularity, and Georgian became the new style. And so here's the First National Bank. I showed you a picture of it just a minute ago. And the bank is in a very high formal Georgian style. And I want you to notice the triangular form on the face of the bank. And for all of the non-architects in the audience, this form is called a pediment in architectural terms. And we're going to see this form throughout the entire rest of the program. When you have the pediment form that you see, the triangle, over a very formal door, it's called a temple front. And we're going to see a lot of this temple front, especially when we talk about the high school. And here's the banking lobby. <coughs> Whenever I'm in downtown Lake Forest, I always try to walk through the bank lobby. Of course, you can't now. The Northern Trust is all closed up with COVID. But this is such an elegant room. It was originally paneled in oak paneling, and uh, the Northern Trust has now had it painted, which is unfortunate. But um, it's still there and still has all of this beautiful detail work to it. On the left is the woman's lounge. Uh, 
uh, this room has now been converted into an office. But this room was originally designed in the 1930s for women to have privacy while they arrange their banking affairs. There's a bathroom, desk, comfortable couches, and more in keeping with Old Lake Forest, it had an open telephone in case Madame needed to call home while she was working out either her banking business or maybe working on her grocery list. And my mom had a funny comment. This room was designed in the 1930s when there's very little air conditioning in town. And so my mom said, if a woman was in town and she was having the vapors, she could then go and seek refuge here. So I always wondered, kind of wondered what the vapors were, but that was kind of her fun comment. And if the Northern Trust opens up the lobby again, and you have a chance to go into the end of the lobby, go down the stair, and admire the beautiful wrought iron gates in the vault area. All of this work is all hand designed, it's all custom built, and it's just beautiful work to see. <clears throat> And then in 1968, my dad doubled the size of the bank with this addition. It was built in several phases. Uh, the first two floors in 1962, and the third floor, the cafeteria, was built in 1968. And subsequently, more additions were added to that. So we're going to move forward a little bit to 1932. And the bank was an important commission for the firm. However, there's an even more important building in the Stanley Anderson collection. As the Depression closed in, Georgian architecture became very popular. This is King Brevard. It is the design base and refinement for all of Stanley Anderson's very popular country Georgian style. <coughs> it's in, it was in Hinsdale. It's sort of between Hinsdale and Burr Ridge. So it's now officially in Burr Ridge. And when Suzanne King Brevard died in 1928, she left an extensive trust fund, approximately $4 million, and that's $1928, uh, to build and endow a retirement home for elderly women. Her endowment built this 80-room retirement home for, as the headline says, spinsters of gentle birth and good breeding, which is the Tribune send-up for this big project. Actually, her will reads, the home is to be dedicated to women over the age of 60, widowed or unmarried, and without funds. So if you met those categories, if you were an unmarried woman over 60 and without any financial support, you could be admitted to King Brevard and live here for free for the rest of your life. And so here's an aerial view, gives you an idea of the size of King Brevard. It sat on 30, it still sits on 30 acres. You can see all the farmlands in the background. <clears throat> and King Brevard was built in 1932 at the very bottom of the Depression. There's all sorts of headlines in the Tribune about the bidding process and whatnot. This was like the only construction project going on at that time. Uh, and here you can see the formal temple front, the triangular pediment over the entrance. And I want you to notice the oculus window and the small dormers in the roof. And this is part of the highly developed scale that the firm used. This is a huge facility, but it doesn't look overpowering. You like the size of the building because it's appropriately scaled. It feels right, it feels comfortable when you're around it. And so here's a slide where you get a better view of the pediment and oculus window. And I also want you to take a look at the swan's neck scroll over the front door. Anderson, Tickner, Bergman, and the draftsman in the firm would describe country Georgian as what we might classify today as American colonial, federal, English, Georgian, or regency in design. <clears throat> All of these forms would fit into their definition of country Georgian. They understood they were mixing a lot of designs together with their phrase, country Georgia. <coughs> Excuse me. So here's a picture of the side of the building, and it gives you an on-the-ground sense of the building's size. And 
I want you to notice the different types of wall design. On the left, stone, then brick in the middle, and then stone and shingles over on the right. And this gives the impression that it was built at different times, when in fact it's all one building. This is part of the country Jordan style. And this is now a co-ed facility, and it's considered one of the finest facilities in the country, and it has a very large uh, memory unit. So let me introduce Suzanne to you. Here is Suzanne King Brevar. When she was a debutante in the 1980s, she was known for her exquisite and very stylish clothing. Her Titian red hair is always mentioned when describing her as one of the most beautiful debutantes of the time. She married Edmund Brevar, a French diplomat, after meeting him at the 1893 Columbia Exhibition. The wind vane was designed by Stanley Anderson, and it's part of his whimsy of having fun with building buildings. <coughs> He's gently chiding Suzanne's high-style dress with a hoop skirt, and also showing off her love of corgi dogs. So here you can see the dining room. You can see it's a huge dining room, as monumental cornices and pediments, all done in the early Georgian style. <coughs> and here you can see the fireplace over mantel. And here we see the swan's neck scroll over the fireplace, which matches the swan's neck scroll at the front door. And Mrs. Mrs. Magoon was an English house mistress who ran King Brevard in the 1930s and 1940s. She required that all women coming down to dine be fully dressed in skirt, heels, and makeup. And a rest, if, a, if a resident didn't want to dress, they would be served in their rooms. And here we see the great room at King Brevard. It's paneled in pine. And you can see it has a great trust ceiling, a monumental fireplace. <coughs> and here we have the porch and upper garden. Uh, the back of the building has a very large garden area. This is the upper garden, uh, which has a formal parterre garden and a reflecting pool. And notice the lovely sleeping porches uh, below the pediment. So as we leave King Brevar, I want you to see all of the wrought iron detail work uh, in the garden fence. We then come to the McElvain house. Stanley and his wife Marty were good friends with the McElveins. They got together for dinner and bridge regularly. <clears throat> Anderson designed several houses for the McElveins, none of which pleased them. In 1934, the McElveins visited cousins in Maryland and stayed at Stemmer House, a 1700s colonial era house. The McElveins sent Anderson to Maryland to draw the house and execute a facsimile for them. Anderson changed the interior almost completely and subtly changed the exterior. What he retained are the half gables that are part of the distinctive style of both the Maryland house and the McElvain house. And here's the main hallway and stair. The floor is made of hard-fired ceramic tiles as Mrs. McElvain was quite a horsewoman. The property had its own six-all stable and the floor is designed for riders who enter the house wearing riding boots. So if the riding boots are dirty, or if the heels are sharp, they don't uh, damage the floor. We go into the dining room. Here's a lovely fireplace and a very formal setting. And then Anderson made it a point to add a library or cozy room to almost all of his houses. This room is paneled in butternut, once common but now very expensive wood that was prized for its lack of graining or other marks. There's almost no blemishes in the wood that you see. <clears throat> and this is where the family gathered on winter afternoons in front of the fireplace. So the house has, in addition to the house having a stable, uh, the house also has a coach house. Uh, this is a four-car garage with doors around on the other side. And there's a gardener's apartment the second floor. So that brings us to the star of today's show, Lake Forest High School. 
This is Stanley's third great country Georgian building. <coughs> and I've devoted an entire chapter in, the, in my book to the high school, so I thought it would make a good example of showing all of the details and all of the intricacies that go into a Stanley Anderson building. So here's an aerial view of the building about 1935 or so. And you can, if you look at the size of the trees on the front of it, you can see that it's a picture that's taken very early on. Um, when I was graduated from the high school in 1971, the elm trees were still standing very tall in front of the building. And of course, those all went away in the 80s and 90s. <coughs> and the other thing to see over on the left is that the driveway swings around to the back of the high school and out to Spruce Avenue. Um, there, aren't, there, there wasn't the great circular driveway that they have today. So there are literally thousands of Lake Forest High School alumni that know that they graduated from a very special school. I'm one of them. I'm assuming most of you here who are alumni also feel the same way. In 2017, Architectural Digest declared Lake Forest High School to be the prettiest high school in Illinois. And so here's the trophy case and central hallway. And in the uh, second photo is the original gym, which uh, then, in my era, morphed into the girls' gym and is now morphed into the library. <clears throat> I don't know, are many of you going on a, on a tour of the high school after this? So I understand there's a walking tour of the building. You'll see how this photograph, the, the big tall windows are still there, but it's now been all carpeted and turned into a library. So it's a very change, a, a very a big change. And so for those of us who attended the high school of a certain era, do we remember the swimming pool? Anybody out here remember the swimming pool? I got a couple of nods out here. Okay. How about one of those real nice, comfortable old wool swimsuits that everybody had? Those nice, icky things. So the pool was called a natatorium back in 1935. A natatorium is a fancy name for swimming pool. But it was important for, the, for Lake Forest High School, being the size it was, to show off the fact that as a public high school, it was big enough and fancy enough to have its own swimming pool. And so that's kind of the bragging rights of trying, of calling it um, uh, the natatorium. And so here we get to science class. And whenever I look at this, I always hear that voice, Bueller, Bueller, Bueller. Does anybody here remember going to science class? I mean, it was just you know one of those things that you had to pass through. Uh, I think there's a periodic table up on the top of the chart. Um, we get to uh, what I didn't realize was a trivia question. Um, I've had people stop me and ask me, um, how many chimneys are on the high school? And there's a couple of ways to answer the question. But if you count the stacks without flutes, and then add all of the flutes with the chimney pots up there, you arrive at 34 chimneys. And what's fun is that only one of those actually worked. The chimney for the fireplace in the library actually worked. The rest of these are all false chimneys. But Stanley Anderson wanted to make sure that there was that dramatic effect of having all the chimneys much like an original Georgian building. So now we're going to jump into uh, the weeds a little bit. I thought the high school would be a good example of showing how much detail work goes into a Stanley Anderson building. If you saw the cartouche that I have mounted out in the foyer of the dedication to the building, you can see that that was drawn full size before it was given to the wood carvers carve and execute the cartouche. The cartouche is still above the front door. Uh, when you're walking around outside the building, look over the front door, you'll see the cartouche. The drawing I have is exactly the same work that was, uh, goes into it. 
So nothing in this building occurs by accident or coincidence. Everything in this building is designed. So when a building is designed, it comes with a specifications manual. Anderson used the manual to enforce an extraordinarily high level of workmanship throughout the entire building process. In the manual for the high school, which is about 80 pages long, there are many boring paragraphs following the building codes and how to install the plumbing and all of that. However, at the end of every single section is a statement that all work shall be done to the satisfaction of the architect. This language, along with the rest of the instructions, states a standard that few contractors would agree to today and may actually be legally unenforceable today. So there's two, kind of, two, there's two uh, requirements here. One says mediocre workmanship will not be acceptable to the architect. The next says all miters and jointing shall be perfect. And when it says perfect, it doesn't mean kind of maybe, it doesn't mean close enough, it doesn't mean good enough for the day, it means perfect, and all work will be done to the satisfaction of the architect. So every part of this building was drawn in exacting detail. This is the main entrance, and sections of the building were drawn full size where necessary. Out in the hallway, you've seen there's the cartouche, and there's also some uh, brick lintel, there's a brick lintel drawing that I have to show you also. Those are drawn to the exact size, the exact standards that are going to be drawn. So I have many drawings in my file that are four feet wide and eight or 10 feet tall. So the specification for the masonry is quite a, a detailed document. The specifications define the color, size, rock face, in many instances, the placement in the wall for each stone. The mason is allowed almost no discretion in building the masonry wall. When you go out and look at the building in, 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 a, in a little while, you're gonna see that everything absolutely fits together perfectly. So, the stone arch over doors or windows is called a lintel. And for the school, Anderson defined exactly how each stone lintel was to be built. Here you see the lintels as drawn and as executed. He specified the width of each stone and the arches, as well as the height and the intersections with the horizontal stone. The details for the brickwork is as exacting as the details for the stonework. And ground brick means that the edges of the side of each brick is cut from a rectangular shape into a trapezoidal shape, so that all the bricks that lay over this way are all hand-shaped. So here are all of the brick lentils defined in one drawing. Each one of the bricks shown in this drawing is ground or shaped to conform to the fan of the arch. Each brick is hand cut. And here are two windows showing the bricks in the fan shape, and above them the drawing provided to the mason to shape the bricks. The masons would grind or shape the bricks at their shop and stand them on the drawing to make sure that they comply with the directions. On the flat lintel on the right, Notice the brick intersections with the horizontal bricks. The mason was not allowed to use any brick chips to fill in the wall. The work had to be perfect and it had to be done to the satisfaction of the architect. This is the library on the second floor. In my time here at the high school, this was the teacher's lounge rather than the library, so I didn't get to spend much time in this space. But I want you to see the fireplace over on the right. And very few high schools have an actual working fireplace. And this one worked until 1957. And I want you to look at the double doors over on the left. The doors, above the doors, is a broken pediment and an urn. I want you to take a look at the urn, because we're going to take a close-up look at it. This is a hand-carved urn that is placed in the woodwork at the school. 
The drawing provides the exact details of how it is to be executed. In the woodworking section of the spec, under the heading quality of workmanship is the statement, all work shall be of the highest grade of fine cabinet work known to the cabinet maker's trade. Further in the woodworking section is the standalone statement, mediocre work will not be acceptable to the architect. And that's kind of like a mantra for your life. Mediocre work is not acceptable. We just, we just don't accept mediocre work. So, not too far. So, um, next point we get to. The false windows and the English tax scale. And the next point, this is all about Anderson's commitment to architectural fidelity. And I'm showing this slide to sort of orient you to where we are with the building. We're over by the entrance to the girls' gym, now the library. And I want you to notice on the first floor, there's four windows, and in the middle is a brick-in window opening. That's a false window. There's a windowsill there, there's a lintel there, and it's all bricked in. So in the 1630s through about the 1840s, English houses were taxed by the window. And the more windows you had, and the larger the windows were, the higher your tax rate. So many English houses had bricked up windows in an effort to lower their taxes. And Anderson added the false window openings, both the square window and the arched window, to make the school look more English. He wanted it to be have, have a greater fidelity to the English style. And this is part of what I say, there isn't a single um, detail in this building that wasn't designed, considered, or executed. So the next thing we get to, so the class of 71, I don't, or class of 1981, I don't know if you spent a lot of time uh, worrying about the senior star. But when I got to the high school in 1967, the tradition was that the story was still very much alive, that if a senior caught a freshman walking on the senior star down in the rotunda, just down the hall, they could make them scrub it with a toothbrush. And this hazing tradition had pretty much died out by the time I arrived. I don't remember anybody in my class in 1967 being forced to scrub the star. But what I do like about this picture is looking at all the faces in the picture. Because everybody in every class, everybody had the loud girl. Okay? And everybody had, you know, all of the, the, the onlookers, everybody laughing and looking on. And if you look in the back, there's a couple people in here who are just kind of clueless, you know, which is kind of also part of our high school classes also. So I'm always really amused by this photograph even though the, the senior star um, hazing uh, tradition seems to have died away. So then in 1960, my dad doubled the size of the high school. He added this auditorium, where we're sitting right now, uh, to the front facade of the building. And the same level of care and creativity went into designing this wing. The wing is so subtle that most people don't realize that this is a mid-century modern style addition grafted onto Anderson's Georgian building. And Anderson and Bergman were quite carefully on this addition so that it would be different yet seem the same as the older part of the building. It retains the pediment and temple front, uh, but the moldings and trim are 1960s simple and subdued. And when my dad completed the auditorium wing, which we're in now, he completed the 1935 vision for the building with three Roman temple fronts. Each of the temple fronts represents a different aspect of Roman culture. In the center, in the main entrance, is the, the search for scholarship and, and knowledge at the main front door. Athleticism seen in the entrance to the gym, now the library. And the great Roman love of theater, rhetoric, and drama as seen as the auditorium temple front. And so we sometimes miss the fact that there is great symbolism in just the way the high school looks. And so here's sort of a long view of the entire high school on a nice clear but snowy day. 
And so I hope you have a better sense of the building, and I hope you have a better sense of the level of detail that goes into uh, designing an Anderson building. And remember, uh, all work shall be done for the satisfaction of the architect. So we're going to um, look at some more country Georgian houses here. And so I hope you're seeing some things that you like and find interesting. So the first house we're going to look at is the Arthur Dixon house. And I'm wondering, does this kind of look like the high school? Does this have some, you know, the pediment and the oculus window and all of that? Well, it ought to remind you of the high school a little bit. Arthur Dixon was a prominent attorney in Chicago. He was president of the family-owned Dixon Transfer Company. And he was also head of the school board that commissioned Anderson to build the high school. And shortly after the high school was begun, he asked Anderson to build this house for him. And if we go around to the rear of the house, you can see the stone surround for the oculus window. And so this work is all very similar to what the, what, what the high school looks like. So you can see how really superbly popular this style was in that time period. And so if we go inside, uh, we see the stair hall uh, down, the, uh, down, down in the main hallway. And here's another one of Anderson's cozy libraries. And so again, on a January a uh, nice snowy January day, you want to be in here with a roaring fire. Then we get to Lake Forest Hospital, sadly, which is uh, uh, Stanley's uh, fourth great Georgian building, great country Georgian building. Um, it was replaced in 2019. But for the Lake Foresters here, how many were, were born in, the, in this old building? So, you know, we have a bunch of hands going on. Um, I was born here also. So here's the rear elevation of the hospital before 1955. My dad filled in this entire back with additions over time. And here's the annual baby day. Uh, this is uh, 58 or 59. And in the background is the new 1957 edition. And the white shape you see on the end of the building was a, a convalescent porch, which turned out to be a surprisingly popular place for So once again, we shift gears a little bit. We're going to go out to the Hunt Country. The firm built about 25 or 30 farms uh, over its career, and this is a big part of the romance uh, of, of the firm's work. And in the center of this montage is Mr. and Mrs. A.B. Dick. The A.B. Dick Company created the mimeograph copying process. That, um, those of us of a certain age will uh, remember uh, as a printing process, you'll remember getting uh, blue ink on paper and a slightly smelly paper, sort of an uh, alcohol kind of smell to the uh, mimeograph paper. They invented that process. And they had a huge 600-acre farm and stable out near Hunt Club Road. They are uh, seen here accepting the best in show cup at the Devon National Horse Competition in 1938. And on the left is John Jelke qualifying as Hunter Jumper at a competition in 1931. And on the right is one of the Temple Lipizzans performing the Corbet, one of the airs above ground that the Temple Lipizzans perform. And I don't know if you know about the Temple Lipizzan performances, but if you get a chance to, um, it's September now, so they may be done for the season, but they have uh, Lipizzan horses on, um, on show on Wednesdays and Sundays, I think. And it's a wonderful thing to do for, for a nice afternoon out in the countryside. The horses are spectacular in watching them perform. So most of the farms are located in the Hunt Country. If you go to Gurney Mills Shopping Center, you'll find the main crossroad is called Hunt Club Road. If you go a few miles north, you'll find the Hunt Club, designed by David Andler. But that's where Lake Foresters uh, have gone fox hunting and ridden to hounds for generations now. And this is where many of the farms uh, are located. And so here's an aerial view of Dick's Field. Anderson began work on this farm in the 1920s. And my dad was still working on it in 1977 when it burned down. 
This was a huge complex. On the uh, mid right is the farm manager's house. And this was a double residence as the Dick's family, the Dick family, shared half the house with the manager's family when the Dicks were in residence. Above that is the oval practice track. To the left center is a large section of stable. That was the indoor practice arena. Next to that is a smaller shed. This is the cattle barn. Uh, in addition to their hackney horse breeding and training operations, the Dicks also raised cattle, hogs, chickens, turkeys, and other livestock. And the long low shed you see extending to the left is the Hackney Horse Stable. So the Dicks developed one of the finest bloodlines for a type of horse called a Hackney. Sometimes they're called Hackney ponies because they're very small horses. They're not racing horses, rather they are trotters. In both pictures you can see the very high stepping gates. They're famous for their ability to trot with their hooves up very high. Billy Hunter was the principal horse trainer and managed the breeding program. He was hired in England and emigrated here to run the horse program. On the right is Mrs. Dick in competition at the Devon Nationals. Here the Hackneys are trotting with their, heart, their hooves in perfect unison. And Mrs. Dick was a very accomplished horsewoman. So here are several views of this enormous stable and barn. Above is a view from the riding arena and shows sort of a full spread of the entire building that you see. Um, below on the left is the cattle barn and silo. And on the right is a view of the bunkhouse with the stable hands below and Billy Hunter's apartment on the second floor as you went up the stairs. And this stable, this farm complex had yearly or annually had about 20 to 25 employees there. It's quite a huge operation. So now we get to the tack room, the porch, and the bar office. So um, the tack room shows all of the harnesses and gear. The tack room is always a very important part of any stable uh, because the gear is so important. And you can see the bar down below uh, that's in the office. And this lets you know that the office was for relaxing uh, in addition to business. And the office opened out on the porch uh, where, the, where you could sit and watch the horses out the paddock. The farm manager's house was where the farm manager lived and where the Dicks stayed on weekends. It was the custom of the 1930s to share the house when the Dicks were in residence. This happened at several of the farms that they did for other like foresters. Uh, there are two separate sleeping areas for the families, and a shared kitchen, dining room, and living room. Helen Dick Bronson, the only daughter, told me that she loved visiting here as a child and playing with the farmer's children. She said it was always a, a very happy place for her. So here's a picture of the shared living room, and I want you to notice the very dramatic wallpaper Helen told me that this was bright blue with yellow flowers. So this room must have really popped when you could see it in color. And then we get to the um, dining room. Helen told me that her family always brought their butler and cook with them from their Lake Forest house when they came out for weekends. So this house would have been a very busy place. And I always have to thank Maddie Dugan uh, Helen Dick Bronson's daughter for allowing me to use uh, the photographs of her family farm. So here we're going to shift gears once again. At the end of World War II, Anderson came home from the Navy and reopened his office. And Anderson is a very interesting person as a vet. In World War I, he was a lieutenant in the Army. In World War II, he was a lieutenant commander in the Navy. So he served in two world wars two different services. So he has quite an interesting military career. At this time, T Tickner had moved on and set up his own practice in Glencoe. And then Anderson hired Bill Bergman to help him design the new flow of business coming into the office. And my dad brought with him a new sense of the mid-century modern design work. 
So one of the first buildings my dad did was the Clay Lichtenstein building. In the early 1950s, there was not a lot of finance money available for commercial buildings. And Bergman built this building for a developer, Clay Lichtenstein, in three sections. The center section was built first, and the wings on either side in the years following. To differentiate the various storefronts, Bergman added a different door hood to each entrance. <coughs> and here you can see the flower shop. This was the last addition to the building. And on the flower shop, he added the wrought iron trellis and the flamboyant uh, metal door hood. At the same time he did this, he did Robertson's, uh, which many of us remember as being a very chic store when it opened in 1954. And this supported a very wide clientele. All the rich, really fancy folk shopped here for clothing, and all the rest of us shopped here for clothing also. It was always a cool place to go. And here's a, a night view of the exterior, and then a view of the interior. And in the same era, uh, my dad designed the Edward Sims house in Lake Bluff. This is a mid-century modern house, and it's designed at the intersection of two ravines. And the house was, de uh, was designed for a dedicated amateur classical musician. You know, the very high ceilings for better classical music acoustics. The owner hosted Mozart and Beethoven quartets on a regular basis here. It's quite a fun house to be in uh, for, for if you were a classical music fan. Um, you can see that the room is mid-century, modern, simple. There are no cornices, there's no details. The fireplace is very simple. The only ornamentation in the room is the redwood beams and the floor-to-ceiling glass windows. Then after that, he took on the house for Mrs. Huntington Henry. Uh, he worked on this French provincial house for Mrs. Henry and her daughter. And this little jewel of a house sits on almost two acres of land. And it's intentionally small to mimic the small urban 18th century houses found in the environs around Versailles. And so let's go inside. And so here's uh, my dad's take on the spiral stair. And if you look at the details of the wrought iron stair rail, Bill Bergman studied French architectural details for several months before beginning design of this house. And here's a detail from the, from the wrought iron work. All of, the, all of this wrought iron work in the baluster is from, uh, based on French patterns, and it's all hand, handmade work. And here's the living room. You can notice all the panel moldings and the cornice moldings. These are all cast in place plaster moldings. This is a very expensive and almost lost construction technique today. And now we get to the kitchen. And this is a house that was done in just a riot of color. And uh, how do you like this for a nice cheery looking kitchen? Mrs. Henry collected all of the tiles for this kitchen on her travels in France. And next we get to the Robert Fisher house in Keokuk, Iowa. Fisher was a grain and starch miller, and he commissioned this house overlooking the Mississippi River. He flew Anderson to the house on his private airplane several times. Uh, and on the trip to review the final construction details, Anderson had a massive stroke and died in 1960. So here's a river view, a uh, house, uh, house overlooking the Mississippi River. And then, uh, so in 1960, the, the firm's name changed to Stanley D. Anderson Associates, and Bill Bergman took over as the principal architect. The firm went on for another 30 years. And so just as Stanley passed away, uh, Bill Bergman began working on the 580 Bank Lane building. And this was considered the largest new building in Lake Forest since Market Square was built in 1916. Many of the people thought, many people felt that it was too modern. It was too, too much. And uh, you can see, uh, uh, oh, I guess not, it's cut off. The, the Deer Path Inn is in the background, but, but uh, it's cut off. 
So you can see in the walkway here, Bergman is trying to keep the bank lane connection that Anderson had envisioned in his earlier English village concept in the 1920s. He wants to connect the deer path in, which would be behind us, and going forward would be uh, deer path road and then further on Market Square. And so he's trying to retain that with this bit of lawn and nice sidewalk here. <clears throat> and then, for those of us who grew up going to the beach, <coughs> my dad designed the new access and public comfort station for Lake Forest Beach. And here he's combining two different design concepts for the building and stairs. He uses a Beaux-Arts concept called Le March for the stairs that progress down to the bluff. He then also added a cladding of mid-century modern rusticated concrete blocks without any other ornamentation. With Le March, he was trying to emphasize the progression or movement from the top to the bottom of the bluff. And he's trying to emphasize that the stairs, that you're always in motion when you're at this building, you're always moving. And he's trying to emphasize that over the fact that it's really, in fact, this is a public restroom. So he's trying to make that fact kind of disappear a little bit because he wants you to enjoy the lake and enjoy the, the travel, the trip from <coughs> top to bottom. So this is a uh, country, Georgia. This is the uh, second to last house we have. This is a uh, country Georgian house done in the 1960s. This is a very understated house, and it is Palladian in design. You can see it has a center mass and then flanking wings on either side. And this is Bergman's take on country Georgian. So here you see a closer look at this very formal but very simple entrance with modernism there's very little interest in all the heavy detailing. So we're going to see that the interior is much more ornate. So as we go into the living room, you can see the lovely cornices, uh, the beautiful drapery, and uh, just the scale of this room is a nice, very comfortable room to be in. And here we get to the fireplace. You can notice that all of the moldings around the fireplace are all very ornate. They're much more ornate than the exterior trim would indicate. Uh, there's heavier cornices and, and lots of casework to admire. So now we get to our last house. This is the uh, Sewell and Shirley Gardner house from 1970, so 1969, 1970. Uh, Bergman and the Gardners called this their California modern house. The windows were custom made in California and were the largest thermal pane windows available at the time. And so that's where the California uh, custom name comes from. And here's the central stair. You can see it's this beautiful spiral stair. Mrs. Gardner was Mrs. Shirley Keith Gardner. Her stepmother was Mrs. Stanley Keith, who an earlier marriage for her was known as Mrs. Kersey Coates Reed. Mrs. Reed Keith has a house designed by David Adler on Lake Road. The house is famous that it has Steuben glass balusters in the stair in the house on Lake Road. As an homage to her stepmother, Mrs. Gardner used lucite balusters in the stair you see here um, in her stair. If you look at the dark brown handrails coming down the stair, they almost look like they're floating as in some places the, the lucite baluster seemed to disappear. And so here's the living room. This is our final view of the house. Uh, the one thing you might notice, uh, in addition to this just being a lovely room, uh, is that the drapery all fits into wall pockets. And the, wall, the drapery in this house ran on motorized tracks. You pushed a button and the drapes opened and closed. You pushed another button and the awnings opened and closed also. So there was a great effort back in 1970 to make this a very modern, very chic style house. So that's the end of our slideshow here. 
And so um, I hope you all had kind of fun looking at all of this. I hope you have fun taking a look at the high school and have a better appreciation of some of the things that Stanley Anderson did. Um, I cut out a great many of the houses so that we could look at the high school a lot. There's a couple of other programs out there that um, will show other aspects of Stanley Anderson's work, so there's more houses to be seen. And um, so this is sort of the end of our lecture, and I want to thank you. So here we are. So if anybody has any questions or great comments or anything, I'm happy to answer anything that you might uh, be interested in. Yes. General question on the high school. Do you have to build the current additions for us today? What current? Uh, no, I have not followed who built the current additions to the high school. So I think they have moved through several different architects in doing that. I think so Perkins that, and Will. I think it was Perkins and Will. Um, Perkins and Will designed the glass box on the end uh, that's down at that way. The new swimming pool and gymnasium stuff that's even further beyond that uh, was done by a firm called OWP, I think. And I can't, I can't remember all of the names for OWP. If, you, if you'd like them, give me a call or something, I can fill you in on that. So there been a couple of different architects that have worked on the building uh, since then. And surprisingly, <coughs> there was an addition where when I was in the high school, there used to be a library. You walk through across the rotunda and straight into a library. That entire addition, I think, has been taken down and is gone. So there's been a lot of changes to the building over time. So, and the swimming pool that we saw, <coughs> everybody has, you know, nightmares about that's gone. That's completely gone and replaced now. So there have been a lot of changes. But, uh, so, any other comments or thoughts? Uh, yeah. You talk about archiving all the drawings <coughs> and so forth. Where are you going to keep the archives? Wow, what a question. Um, my dad died in 1994. <coughs> and I was uh, happily being an attorney and working downtown and married. And so I didn't have much interest in, it, in all of this. I called the Art Institute. Uh, Burnham Library. I talked to the curator there, John Zukowski, and said, Hi, huh, this is who I am, this is what I have. I have this enormous collection, and I'd like to give it to you. <coughs> Excuse me, I keep having this little tick in my throat. Um, he said, Well, we've had the David Adler collection for 25 years and haven't been able to do anything with it because it's not cataloged. And your collection sounds very interesting. If you'd catalog it, we'd be interested in talking to you. Well, here I am, you know, 25 years later, and I'm still cataloging the stupid collection. So at some point, I would like to um, give all of this either to the Art Institute uh, or some other institution that has the curatorial uh, <coughs> facilities to take care of it. <coughs> I can't give it to just a local museum and have, as one fellow said, we'll have a couple of high school kids take care of it for you. Um, the paper is too del delicate and there's just simply too much stuff there uh, to be uh, just sort of manhandled. So at some point, uh, I'm hoping to donate it to uh, uh, Art Institute, Chicago History Museum, or some other facility like that. It would be nice to get it out of my basement. <laughs> so I have a handful of um, dehumidifiers down there and all sorts of other stuff to try and keep it all sort of at the proper humidity level and, and, and whatnot. So I think Yeah, we just keep working our way through. In addition to all of the drawings, in addition to the 10,000 drawings, I have several bookcases full of all of these magnificent architecture books also. And as they keep getting older and older, their value keeps going up and up and up. Some of the books are very rare and, and very valuable. So it would be nice to, to move those along to somebody who could use them, and, uh, perhaps in some library facility like that. So, yeah, Jamie. Paul, well, um, where was your dad's architecture class? I'm sure you answered that already, but I did that. And is there still? Uh, any um, second or third generation of that operating? No, the firm, my dad closed the firm in 1992. There, 
there just wasn't any business left. Um, for 30 years, the phone kept ringing. Hi, is Stanley there? I need someone to come and look at my house. And it was amazing that the Stanley Anderson name for 30 years was still a calling card. And towards the end of my dad's career, he worked under both the Bill Bergman name and the Stanley Anderson name. But he kept the Stanley Anderson name in the phone book. People kept calling up, hey, I've got a Stanley Anderson house. I need your help. The office uh, was in the Deer Path Theater building. And in the, it was on the second floor, and where the theater marquee was, was where the drafting room was. So as a kid, I used to be able to stand in the drafting room, look out the window, and read the marquee from, you know, about this far away. So they were there uh, for 50, uh, 50 years or so, and then the firm, uh, my dad moved the firm home to his house. So um, we were in downtown. I, I was, as a little kid, I was always in downtown Lake Forest and walking up the stairs to the second floor. So, but, so, uh, Pat. One, the fireplace in the library. And what I absolutely love about library history, both at Lake Forest Library and here in the high school library, you had a working fireplace at the Lake Forest Library. You had several working fireplaces in a library. When you think about the combustibility of all of the books <laughs> and people walking around poking the fire and throwing logs on the fire and stuff. It just cracks me up to think of people sitting around by a nice warm fire in a public building. Uh, the fire department would explode, their heads would blow off if you did that today. But the only working fireplace here is on the second floor in the library. In 1957, they went and uh, re-tuck pointed, they tuck pointed all of the chimneys and at that time, they closed off the fireplace in the library. So, yeah. Right. Okay. Saying, they yes. So. So good. Well, thank you all for coming. This has been a great show. I love talking about Stanley Anderson, and um, there's always more to talk about. So, um, if there's a, if, you, if if I put on another show, please come once again. You'll find something else to look at. So. Thank you very much. Thank you.